Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, my name is Paul Tuff, and I am joined here today by Angel Perez and Father Steve Katsouros uh, to uh, discuss some ideas that came out in my book that was published last year called uh, Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us. Um, so I'm going to spend a lot of time today uh, asking questions of Angel and uh, Father Steve, but I want to start off by telling you a little bit about how I met them and how we all got here. So my book, The Years That Matter Most, is an investigation of two big themes in American life, higher education and social mobility, and how those two big themes uh, intersect and collide in American life these days. I spent about six years reporting this book. It was the most rewarding reporting experience I've ever had. But the paradox that I kept coming up against as I reported was that for individual young people in this country today, higher education is still the great engine of social mobility. You know, a college degree is the best and surest path to economic stability and success, especially for uh, young people who are growing up in uh, uh, outside of affluence. But these days for the country as a whole, that engine of mobility is broken. And instead of serving as a force for social mobility, higher education has for many people become an inequality machine that perpetuates class divisions and puts obstacles in their way. So the pleasure of reporting this book was really in meeting um, with students, with, with young people across the country, high school students and college students who were trying to figure out how to get this system to work for them. Um, but also meeting with innovators, with leaders uh, who were finding new tools, new programs, new systems that would let them better serve students. Uh, and two of the most inspiring innovators who I met in my reporting are here with me today. They both have actually switched jobs this summer, uh, switched jobs since I did my reporting with them. They've both uh, been promoted. Um, and Angel Perez is now the president of NACAC, the National Association for College Admission Counseling. But before he took that job this summer, he was the head of admissions and student success at Trinity College, which is a small selective private institution in Hartford, Connecticut. And I met him back in the winter of 2017 when I visited Hartford and he agreed to let me do, uh, uh, to, to, he agreed to let me behind the curtain of college admissions. Um, and he showed me over the course of my reporting there how he was trying to do this pretty bold thing, which was to transform Trinity College through admissions. How he was trying to take a student body that was dominated by white wealthy prep school grads for decades and inject some new blood and some new life into it. And Father Steve Katsouros is now the president and CEO of the Come to Believe Network. When I met him a few years ago though, he was the founding dean of a brand new startup college in Chicago called Rube. Uh, and over my time reporting this book, I visited a few times, sat in on classes, met students, met professors and watched as Steve built this brand new type of two-year college, which he's gonna describe for us today, that was dedicated to educating a student population that is especially ill-served by our current system. So when I met them a few years ago, he, he were these two, two different men in different jobs working for two very different institutions. But what really struck me about them was that they were asking the same questions, the same big questions. Who is higher education really for? Who in our society deserves a college degree? And what can we do to expand that answer, to provide opportunity for more, many more young people? So today you're gonna to get a chance to hear from them about their work uh, and what they've learned along the way and where they think higher education needs to go. The way we're gonna work this is that the three of us are going to speak together for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then we are going to um, respond to your questions, which you can start asking uh, through the Q&A function anytime. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you and we're gonna dedicate the last um, 15 minutes or so of our conversation to those questions. So I wanna start off uh, by welcoming uh, you, Steve, and you, Angel. Um, and Steve, I wanna start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what Arupe College is and what you did there and what you're doing now? Terrific. Thank you, Paul. Yes, so Arupe College, uh, named for a Jesuit priest uh, like I am, 
Father Pedro Arupe, great leader of the Jesuits in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Arupe College is a two-year college within a Jesuit university called Loyola University in Chicago. We opened in 2015. Arupe awards associate's degrees, and it's um, for first-generation students who are either Pell eligible or undocumented students. They're right out of high school. Average GPA coming from high school 2.5 to 2.9, uh, mostly from a Chicago public high school. And these are students who are often left out of Jesuit higher education, and they could never imagine going to a place like Loyola because they perceive it as too competitive, too selective, and too expensive for them. So what did we do? And I, I arrived in Chicago in 2014 and started working with my colleagues to design a college uh, for this population that really inculcated a culture of belonging and really built community. We're also very focused on completion rates. And finally, we're very focused on our students not incurring debt. The goal was for our students to graduate with little to no debt. We provided a lot of uh, wraparound support services. Our full-time faculty members were trained as academic advisors. We learned that the academic advising happening in city colleges around the country, well, the loads are hundreds and hundreds of students. Um, the faculty at Arupe had 20 to 25 advisees. We called this intrusive advising. Um, part of that's based on my own uh, personality, but also I'd like to think that it's based on um, the style of Pope Francis uh, of accompanying students. We're accompanying these students uh, during their first post-secondary ed uh, experience. And it seemed to work. You know, students would say to us, you know, we came to Arupe for the affordability, but we stay at Arupe because of the opportunity and the community. We had a number of successes and other institutions were watching what Loyola University was doing with this new academic unit with Arupe College. One, St. Thomas University in the Twin Cities approached us and, and, and replicated our model. They were looking at successes like a 55% completion rate in two years versus, you know, a 14% completion rate for two year for most for two year colleges around the country and in cities like Chicago, it's generally single digits. Um, we're a bridge program. 88% of our graduates uh, would go on to uh, four year institutions, and 75% of these students are completing their bachelor's in four or five years' time versus. 14% of those who start in two-year colleges completing their bachelor's in six years' time. So I was, as I spent more and more time with different colleges and universities, my Jesuit superior said, Steve, we think you have something here. We want you to begin to develop a network to support the, the replication, the scaling of this model that's been so successful in Chicago, hence the Come to Believe network that's begun. And I'm happy to report that I have customers already. I've been working with um, a, a non-Catholic institution, um, Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, and then Fairfield University, a Jesuit school in Connecticut. So that kind of gives you an overview of, of where I've been and where I see Come to Believe going. Uh, with this this little movement of ours in in terms of two-year colleges leveraging the resources of a larger already established university great thank you for that um exciting times uh for you and for that network um okay angel i want to go over to you for a moment um so angel perez when i met you you as i said were at uh, working for just one college at trinity college you now are running this huge national organization and you have this national platform uh, the ideas that we were talking about in your office um you suddenly have this platform to to uh, make real change so what tell me what you're doing what what are you hoping to accomplish uh, at NACAC? yeah thanks paul and thanks for having me um so you're right i mean i i've been given this privilege of a, of a huge national platform and you know, I, I used to do design thinking a lot when I was at, at Trinity College and the first um, sort of principle of reinvention is to have deep levels of empathy for the people that you're serving, right? And so I actually now serve 15,000 high school counselors and admissions officers all over the country and around the world. And because of the issues you lay out in your book, Paul, you know why the job is extraordinarily challenging. And now you add on top of that COVID um, and their jobs have become really, really challenging. So, you know, really what I'm focusing a lot of my time on right now is supporting them and supporting their work and giving 
giving them the kind of training that they might need in order to do to do the work they need to do on the ground. But at the same time, because of the, the questions that I still have about who is higher education for, um, I am using this platform to really advocate around those issues, to really try to sound the bell around the fact that higher education is a public good, particularly at public colleges and universities, and that in, in America, it is an economic imperative, not a social justice imperative for us to open the doors wider. Um, I think right now, especially where we are with our politics, oftentimes the social justice imperative does not um, lend itself to, to legislators, but I think an economic imperative does. And then the other thing, um, which we can talk about later as well is, you know, I have this deep um, passion for a reinvention of the application process. You know, when you went out there and spoke to all of those students, Paul, you realize that, you know, they get so lost because the process is so cumbersome and bureaucratic and difficult to navigate. And because of COVID, we're really trying to use this opportunity to gather um, foundations and researchers and admissions officers and school counselors to actually think about what does college admission look like in the future that simplifies the process and gets more students into the pipeline. So, so lots of things we're working on, but I would say that those are three biggies. Great. So, Angel, I, wanna, I wanted to stick with you just for a moment and, and ask you about this, this shift that I, I feel like is happening in the field of higher education that I, certainly has happened to me in my, my years of reporting on it. Um, and I wonder if it's happened to you as well as you've moved from uh, one kind of institution to another. Um, and that is that, that there, there are sort of two questions that I feel like higher education has been wrestling with when it comes to social mobility. And, and the first one, and I think it has in some ways been the dominant one, uh, certainly in the media and philanthropy over the past decade or so, is how do we increase access at our nation's elite colleges for Pell eligible and first generation students? Um, there's been a lot of talk about it. Uh, I talk about it a lot in my book. There's been a lot of uh, philanthropic resources uh, thrown at it. When you were at Trinity, obviously that was what you were focused on since Trinity is one of those institutions institutions. And at Trinity, in the years that I, I uh, followed you as a reporter, I watched you increase the Pell percentage uh, uh, at, um, at Trinity from about 10% to about 14%. And, um, and that's a win, no question about it. But it also was clear to me how hard that was um, at Trinity. Uh, and I think it's true at many institutions like it to make even that degree of change. And in the end, you know, given the magnitude of the problem, the number of highly qualified low income students uh, who need uh, a good, a better, higher education, um, it was a pretty small part of a fix. But when you look at the national numbers, uh, it suggests that, that you know, there's, there hasn't been a lot of change, that the, percent, the Pell percentages at elite colleges are about the same as they were a decade ago when we all started talking about this. And at the same time as a nation, there's been this, this much bigger uh, uh, phenomenon going on, which is that we've been defunding uh, public higher education. And that, that is the, the, the part of higher education that educates most of our students. Most of our students go to public institutions and certainly most of our low income students, that's the, the pathway that is providing them with the most opportunity. But at this moment, we have been defunding it. That's something we can control, you know, as voters, as taxpayers, uh, our legislators actually have, have some levers they can shift. So I'm wondering from this new position, now you're, you're responsible for a much broader um, set of institutions, how do you balance out those two goals? Do you feel like one is more important? Do they fit together? Are they in competition? How do we, how do we solve them both at the same time? Yeah, I, I think, I think we, we try to work on both at the same time. And, and the reality of the matter is, I think every sector of higher education has a role to play in opening the doors wider and bringing more students um, from diverse backgrounds. And again, sticking with the economic imperative argument, you know, the fastest growing population in this country are low income first generation students. And if we do not figure out a way to get them into the pipeline to all sectors of higher education, our economy is not going to look so good um, a decade or, or 15 years from now. But you know, Paul, I would say, in, again, because of your book, your, your, your viewers and readers will understand that it's extraordinarily complicated. I think that the narrative with the media is, well, wealthy colleges should just take more students because they, they have more resources. That yes, in an endowment, and if you study the work of endowments, it's not that simple. It's, it's not a bank that you could go to and just withdraw money. Um, as well as the fact that a little known 
fact that uh, most people don't realize is that even some of the most highly selective institutions in this country are highly, highly tuition dependent, right? And so I have worked at schools that are highly selective, have a brand name, but at the same time, they depend on 75, 80, or 85% of their revenue to come from tuition dollars. Um, and so the reality is that the more financial aid you give, the less tuition and revenue you take in. And that financial model is not sustainable for the long term. So it is really complicated. But along with this, you know, you talked about the public sector being defunded over time. You know, I, I think about tackling this issue from four perspectives. One is we need as a society and voting is your one way that you can do this is to really reestablish higher education as a public good in this country that that we we fund higher education institutions and students who want to go to higher education institutions a that does not burden them with so much debt that that it ends up really burdening them along the way. But the other piece is there's there's the pipeline issue which you probably experience when you talk to students, that when we live in a country where in Arizona you have 900 students to one school counselor, that is not a recipe for success around getting students into the pipeline. So we need to fund the K through 12 system, particularly the public system, much better. But at the same time, there's two other things that other sectors can do, and one is the public. There has to be a paradigm shift around what it means to go to college in this country. Um, the reality is every school that I worked at tried to keep up with the Joneses, right? The, the nice athletic facilities and the pools and the residence halls, there is this sort of dream of what that actually looks like. And, and colleges feel a real pressure to do that and as a result, push down the cost of the student. Um, and at the same time, colleges and universities and, and COVID has exacerbated this, also really have to think about how, how they control their costs and how they deliver the product differently. So, so I think you can tackle it in a lot of different ways. Great. So, Steve, that 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 brings me back to you because I feel like um, you are you are trying to bridge that divide between elite institutions and and low income students in a very different way, right? You are you are trying to encourage elite institutions, especially Catholic institutions, but not only to serve a population that they're not always serving well now. Um, so, I'm wondering why that why that feels to you like the right solution. Like, and 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 those students who Arupe is is serving, you know, what other in, uh, options do they have right now, and and why do they need something different? I want to build on what Angel was uh, just saying regarding the pipeline. You know, and having spent six years in Chicago and uh, garnering the support of Chicago funders. Um, employers are looking for pipelines uh, to provide them with uh, employees who are credentialed, who are qualified, who are well trained to be successful. And um, they're looking at Arupe College as a supplier of, of, of those students who are qualified, who are credentialed, who are prepared to be successful. So I think that's a draw as these universities are interested in going going deeper in their own geographic communities, their own regions, to provide um, skilled workers and employees for, um, for, their, for their local communities. You know, I also want to build on the idea of mission that for a lot of these, as you mentioned, Catholic schools, but in general, uh, you know, this is the right solution because this is the stated mission for these these institutions. For the Catholic institutions, uh, there's an investment in Catholic social teaching. And this brings that uh, to life. Um, this is also, as I talk to Fairfield University, for example, or other Catholic or Jesuit institutions, this model is really a return for them, a return of the impetus for their foundings back in the 19th and 20th centuries to you know, uh, uh, offer higher educational opportunities for, uh, for the marginalized, for, for immigrants, for first generation students, for, 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 for commuters. So they are returning to the spark that you know their founders uh, saw for them uh, 100 and 150 years ago with with new populations but with some similarities you ask about options for the students that i worked with at arupe that the come to believe network uh wishes to work with in the future well you know uh, again as i said arupe was founded so the students would graduate with little to no debt you know and in arupe 75 percent of the students graduate with no debt uh, the other option would be to take out more loans and incur debt, not an attractive option, uh, to attend uh, um, institutions that are under-resourced, 
and uh, that are not well supported and where their, the completion rates are lower or to attend institutions where students uh, don't feel like they belong. You know, Paul, I was first introduced to the work of David Yeager in your earlier book, How Children Succeed, and this notion of belonging. If you feel like you're on campus, or what your background is, uh, and you don't belong, it's going to be hard for you to persist and to be successful and, and uh, to uh, complete. So, you know, for a lot of these students who are first gen, who are uh, people of color, if they're in a primarily white institution, they feel like they don't belong. Um, there, there are going to be some challenges along the way. So those are the other options for these students. So we talked about Fairfield, we talked about break and their interest in this model. Well, they're interested in our success, in um, our retention and completion rates. This is also in their wheelhouse. I mean, uh, Arupe College, the Doherty Family College at St. Thomas University, the replication of Arupe, 61 credits these students are getting in general ed requirements. So this is what colleges and universities do. But it's also an opportunity for these higher institutions to provide substantive change, uh, systemic change, to address the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues on their campus, to get away from the deficit narrative. And, you know, really, the meaning of the title of Come to Believe, are, it's from John's Gospel, uh, but uh, it also, it's gradual, it's a process. So our students come to us uncertain if um, they are going to be successful in uh, a college within uh, a private, competitive, selective institution. They come to believe that they can be successful. They will, and they'll contribute to the culture of the college. Uh, similarly, I think that these higher institutions are coming to believe that these students are, are worthy of the investment in creating these, these kinds of programs and resourcing them so these students cross the finish line and uh, go on to the next best chapters of their lives. Great. Um, I wanted to f follow up uh, on something that Angel said, and 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 Steve, get your get get both of your thoughts on this, which is the, the sort of big big question, Angel, that you posed of like, what does it mean to go to college, right? What do you what what do you need to have that real college experience? And it strikes me that you know the two institutions you were working at when uh, when I met you both um, had a somewhat different answer to that question, right? And and it and it played out in costs. So um, I don't know if you know this number off the top of your head, but Angel, I'm guessing you know the Trinity was spending. 70, 80, 90, $100,000 to educate each of its students. Um, and uh, Steve, I think you've told me that, that Arupe is spending somewhere 12, 15, $17,000 a year to educate each one of its students. Uh, in both cases, right. the, actual, the students are spending, uh, paying less of that money at Arupe, much less. Um, but that's just what the institutions uh, have, have sort of deemed as necessary to get a college education. Um, you know, I think there, there's, there are, there have been innovative ideas about how just how low we can get that number, right? The, the, the push behind MOOCs a few years ago was designed to just see whether we can get it to, to um, you know, not much more than a Wi-Fi connection. Um, where, where do you both draw the line? Where, where do you think is the right number? How, Steve, how did you decide what was necessary to keep in and what you could, what you could uh, get rid of in order to, to hang on to, um, uh, to a real college education? Yeah, we were very lean, uh, very streamlined. And the design of Arup Bay and the Doherty Family College at St. Thomas is to leverage the resources of the larger universities. So we had a building on campus. We uh, benefited from the university's advancement office, um, HR office, legal uh, assistance, from the library and other, uh, and the, the, the RecLex. So all of those resources uh, and assets of the larger university, we had access to, and therefore we were able to keep the cost. If our enrollment was 350 students, then we were able to keep the cost at a little over 15,000. 60% of that was covered by student revenue. So Pell Grants, state aid, and um, depending on the expected family contribution, for most students, it was, it was, there was nothing charged, but. Uh, the average for students who were paying tuition was $1,700. We rely a lot on philanthropy. Uh, you know, a lot of my work was, was fundraising, and 40% of, of a $5.2 million budget uh, fell under, under uh, fundraising. And yet, this was so attractive to funders. You know, how to provide a high-quality, high-touch, 
higher ed experience uh, to first gen students who would have never dreamed of going to an institution like Loyola University. Angel, any thoughts about that question for you? I mean, I, I know you, Trinity, when you were there, was under some financial pressure. And so the, the question of like, where can you cut, I'm sure was a, conver a part of a conversation that, that you and your colleagues were having. Um, and it's not an easy question to answer, right? Where, where what do you, what, what's your answer to that question of, of where can you save what it means to go to college? Yeah, I, I think it's complicated and I think it's dependent on the institution, right? And also the, the deep history and also the culture of philanthropy at the institution. So the, the piece I'll mention why it's complicated, particularly at institutions with a lot of history and a very loyal alumni base is the minute you cut something that is of a fan base of your alumni base, you actually are shooting yourself in the foot because you are no longer going to get donations from a particular sector of your population. The other piece, going back to endowments, which we could do a whole panel on, um, but we don't have time to do that is, you know, for example, I, I'm sure that it, it privately college presidents would tell you, I would be delighted to cut X sport or X program, but sometimes those things are written into endowments um, and right. they, they're not able to touch it. And so it is extraordinarily common complicated to, to do that and also to not lose faith from the faculty and things like that. So there's a lot of politics that goes into the cut as well. Um, all right, I'm starting uh, to get questions from our audience members um, and I want to start throwing those to the two of you. Um, we have about 15 minutes to go in our session. Um, the first one is about employers. What role can and should employers play in helping increase access and equity in higher education? Either of you. I would say that the future has to include employers. And some of those conversations are actually already happening at the local level at different institutions. But I, I see, for example, what some of the Silicon Valley firms are doing with institutions, you know, subsidizing some of the education, um, creating pipeline programs into their, their actual uh, workforce. And so I do think they have to be a part of the conversation. And what's always really interesting to me and one of the hats I wore at, at my previous institution was career development, is that the employers were not talking to the institutions and the faculty who were creating the curriculum. And so there's this huge disconnect between what the skill set is that's needed once they graduate and what's actually being taught on campus. Um, and so I, I see the future being that those two entities end up being a little bit closer. Interesting. Steve, any thoughts on that? I like that. Yeah, I really like the idea of the interaction between uh, potential employers and, and faculty members. My own experience at Rupe College was um, that a lot of our students could not see themselves in uh, different professions uh, because um, they didn't know anyone who um, was working in a, in a particular profession. And so, so much of our work was identifying uh, younger alumni of Loyola University, um, people in their 20s or 30s who weren't making six figures yet, but who looked like our students. And therefore, all of a sudden, our students said, huh, I never thought of myself in marketing or getting a CPA or working at Ernst & Young. Uh, but she went to my high school or he's from my neighborhood. And, um, and how did they do that? And all of a sudden, um, there was this opening, you know, so, um, so many um, opted for degrees in um, behavioral and social sciences um, because they were familiar with those professions, but meeting younger alumni of Loyola University and other area colleges in, in Chicago who were uh, Black and Latinx um, uh, who were working in different professions was really revelatory for, for our students and a, a great way for our students to begin to network. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work with boards of trustees. We had a very diverse board um, at Arupe, and we were very proud of that. But most of the board members were my age, you know, 50s and 60s, and they were on the board because they could contribute financially. That wasn't helpful for our students. You know, they really needed someone, someone who was, in second year of law school, you know, mm -hmm. who hadn't made it yet, but they did have a bachelor's degree and they were in law school and, um, and they went to their high school. That was meaningful for our students. 
All right, new question from the audience. Thank you for that. New question from the audience. Um, do you think there is a role for for-profit colleges? Um, and I'll, I'll ask that in two ways. One is just, do you think there's a role uh, in, in higher education for for-profit colleges. But then specifically, is there a way that for-profit colleges can address some of the issues that we're talking about, can, can bridge some of the gaps for low-income students? Steve, you want to take that one first? Uh, yeah, I, um, you know, having uh, um, accompanied a number of students who had family members who had uh, terrible experiences, with for-profit colleges, I'm really not uh, the best person to ask that question. Again, <laughs> remember, I am all about little to no debt. And, um, but I was hearing about older siblings of our students in Chicago and the debts that they had incurred and then the lack of completion rates um, was obviously a, a, a very painful for me to hear. Yeah, I, I agree. I would say maybe to, to disagree a little bit with Steve, there can be a role, um, but I need to be convinced, right? Because if you look at the, the data around debt, the data around job placement, it's atrocious and, and it really is doing a disservice primarily to underrepresented populations in this country. So we're actually doing more harm than good. And so until some of those schools can actually prove to us um, that they can be for profit, but still be ethical, I'm skeptical. Um, okay, any questions coming in? Just one moment. Uh, okay, I just got a new one that I want to throw out to you both. Uh, either of you can uh, dive in, which is this. What is your level of confidence that incumbent higher education institutions today can rise to the challenge that you're discussing? Do we need more new players without the legacy cost structures and ways of doing business to meaningfully change the game? So can, can incumbent existing higher education really rise to this challenge or do we need new players? I guess I'll start in, and I will say because I'm the ever optimist or else I could never do this work um, or have spent 22 years on a college campus, I think it can be done. And actually I think that the, the COVID crisis has exacerbated um, the, the situation and also has forced institutions to think differently and move very, very quickly on issues that I think probably would have taken a long time. If you know anything about governance in higher education, it is the slowest moving um, process, uh, much slower moving than, than govern, government. But I have been really impressed at some of the changes that institutions are making in such a short period of time. But I will say that I also think it will take new players in the game. I mean, we're hearing a lot of conversations about micro-credentialing and about organizations like Google, for example, creating their own credentials. I think there's space for everyone, but I also think those kinds of new players in the game are going to pressure higher education to change and change faster. Steve, any thoughts? Yeah, just to build on that, yeah, just to build on that uh, quip here, I mean, I'm obviously a Catholic priest. I'm uh, part of a organization that is not known for rapid change uh, and yet it's also very glacial so uh, in terms of in terms of change um, but we're in this moment now you know COVID has accelerated uh, change and also we were even before uh, the pandemic we were looking at the demographic cliff in 2025 2026 and so uh, higher education has been called to be nimble and finally um, you know, we, in, in light of George Floyd, in light of Breonna Taylor, there's a call now for substantive change uh, and not for another panel, another march, uh, but something that is going to be substantively addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion on these campuses. It will require uh, a, a new kind of thinking, an entrepreneurial way of thinking, a letting go of, of um, of what I think in many ways are, are pretty broken systems uh, in order to achieve this equity. Again, uh, if you look at philanthropy, if you, even in this time of great economic uncertainty, uh, what is drawing major philanthropists is DEI issues. And so uh, higher ed leaders uh, are, are smart to begin to invest in first-gen students and programs for first-gen students and programs for um, 
um, undocumented students uh, in um, uh, um, Pell eligible students because there's an, uh, a huge appetite for that in terms of philanthropy right now. So, Angel, I join you uh, in your in your optimism right now that uh, the, practically there's a need and uh, there's 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 support. So we're on the same page. Great, and and so maybe in the hopes of trying to stay on that optimistic note, as as our end moment comes up in just four minutes, um, I want to ask about uh, the pandemic, and and not not usually um, uh, something that provokes a lot of happy uh, smiles um, and and optimistic takes. Um, but are, do you see at, at this particular moment in what the pandemic has done to higher education this year? Any uh, hopeful signs? Do you think there is a way that this might shake up some of our preconceptions or some of our institutions in ways that are going to allow us to better serve uh, the students who need the help of higher education the most? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I've been... I, 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 I... Go ahead, Steve. Yes, yeah, Steve. You, you I was go... going to say that institutions continue to, to, continue to scramble um, and we're hearing varying um, degrees of satisfaction with um, um, online and hybrid. Um, I'd like to think that um, what's going to come of this is, yes, online, yes, hybrid, but how do you develop community and how do you create support services in delivering this online? That's going to be the successful online uh, transmission of, 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 of higher education. And, um, you know, I'm seeing glimmers of that at Rupert College, at St. Thomas University. And when I talk to other institutions that are interested in, in replicating our model, but that is going to be critical. How do you, um, again, uh, create a, a community, a sense of belonging, even when we're online? So that, that, that's my take. Angel, yeah, I, I agree. And, and I would say coupling COVID with also where we are with racial reckoning in this country. <laughs> Paul, right before I came onto this call, I was actually preparing for a panel with college presidents who are really trying to bring forth a call to action around, even though we are all suffering financially, because higher education has taken a huge hit and is not in a great place right now, um, there really is an intentional conversation happening around how do you make sure that financial aid and diversity does not fall to the bottom of the list given the financial pressures that we are all feeling. So, so that really has inspired me to realize, you know, there's some intentional conversations happening to make sure that this is our moment in history that we can't let slip by. Um, great. Well, we got a couple more minutes. What, well, when you think just about next year, so, so next year, ooh, there are signs that it could be a dark one, hope that it could be a brighter one. What, a year from now, what would you like to see going on in higher education that would make you feel more hopeful? Angel, why don't you go first? Well, for me, from I guess I'll talk from an admissions process perspective because I spend so much time with admission officers and financial aid officers is a greater simplification of the process, a greater focus on what's right for students. Um, as you know, many institutions have gone test optional because of the fact that, that um, you know, COVID has prevented SAT administrations. But I also think it's opening up a different conversation for admission officers around what is the information we actually need in order to determine success in college. And, you know, there's all these studies that show simplification can lead to greater access. And so from the purview where I'm sitting and the work that I'm trying to do, I'd like um, colleges to make the process simpler to, to be able to open the doors wider. Great. Steve, can you give me a 60 second version? Uh, what would you like to see a year from now to make you more hopeful? Sure. Similarly to uh, Angel, I would say um, we need to be looking at new financial models uh, at, that create more access uh, for students that will increase enrollment and will increase institutions' commitment uh, to DEI and to enrolling students who otherwise uh, have been marginalized by inequitable practices and higher education. So again, I'm optimistic. It's really going back to that, that, that initial question, who is higher education for? Um, and, and, and to find better answers, including better financial, uh, financial models for, for, for who higher ed is intended for. Great. 
All right. Um, well, I want to leave it there. There's plenty more to talk about, but we'll leave it there for now. Thank you, first of all, to uh, to our audience for being here, for joining us in this conversation, even though we can't see you behind that screen. Um, and thank you for the great questions that you gave us. Um, thanks to ASU GSV for making this happen um, under difficult circumstances and for inviting the three of us to have this conversation. Um, and thank you to Angel Perez, the president of the National Association for College Admission Counseling, and to Father Steve Katsuros, the president and CEO of the Come to Believe Network. Um, thanks very much for a great conversation. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks very much.